Aware always where I am in moment, trying not to mix energy with those forcing misery upon self and world, through insane conduct always attracting karmic consequence. Long have I learned to recognize cycles and patterns, embracing embracing the wisdom of higher teaching. I am rambling free now, one moment to the next, with no particular affiliation or set way. One must seek out and find spirit for personal awakening, giving thanks to creator and creation in one's own way. The magnificent earth a temple worthy of housing the holy. I praise the Most High for my conscious being. Finding church this moment, may I always act upon what I know. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Fallen Angels TV, and it's another Sabbath broadcast as we Move on into spring, this being the second day of it, and I hope that wherever you may be, that you are finding the day beautiful and glorious, and that you are finding your spirit moved by just the warmth and the um, abundance of inspiration that comes from spring and the collective blooming and of the creatures and the birds as all things begin to prepare for what will be the warm coming warm months and chance to um, really be outside in the elements and to experience nature in in what is a paradisical way because uh, I don't know if you're that moved by by spring as I am, but um, I think that, you know, the unfolding of spring and creation and the way that it all comes together in grand harmony as the the great mystery is absolutely the most fascinating film one could ever imagine or piece together and that the creator has done all of this so that we can be witness to the grandeur of his majesty in every aspect of what is the creation from macrocosm to microcosm because all things reflect his glory. And in everything, I see and feel the presence of wonder and just am awed humbled by the awesomeness of of everything. And I know for a lot of people that um, even the kids of today, they've, they've lost this perspective. They're not, they don't see the beauty, the magnificence within nature and just are overwhelmed by waking up to new day and being exposed to new dream. And, I guess having uh, acquired a, a severe disability long ago in my life and having my mortality tested for moments because uh, I did die four times in the process of transitioning to my disability. But um, when you're touched in that way by the severity of moment and almost have all your tomorrows taken from you, it's a reality check. And it it gives you perspective to reassess what is new and what is important and what is relevant in life and being. And also gives you a chance to realign yourself with priority, relationships, 
not only among people, but, you know, with the creation and with God and with whatever it is that you thought was important in your life, whether it be, um, you know, uh, certain certain things of interest, whether it's uh, even the opposite sex or certain pastimes, recreational pursuits. Um, a lot of time for people it will be it, drugs or alcohol or uh, or pills or you know anything of that nature, or even you're in your focus with your job and those things which consume so much of your life. I long ago uh, have had this chance and I decided that, you know, really to only do what I thought was important and to not waste any time, to not allow myself to to spend a lot of time on tr- pursuits that I thought were trivial or meaningless or nonsensical. Now, there's a difference between holding balance as far as um, seeking entertainment and finding joy and pleasure in life because that also is an absolute necessity and it's beneficial for spirit and for soul, for the heart and for emotional, mental and uh, physical and um, spiritual well-being for people to do that. But it's also good for people to focus on achievement and dreams and goals and doing things which are real. And that, for me, is the focus on the kingdom and also the uh, the focus on our eternal inheritance, because that's really what we're here to do and what we're here to achieve and accomplish and uh, realigning ourselves with the salvation that has been graciously extended to all of us by the sacrifice of the Most High on the cross and giving of himself as Passover lamb so that we could have a cleansing of slate, a, a renewed opportunity for for doing the works that would align with the faith that comes with bearing the cross and comes with being the example that Christ was for us in being a good servant to each other and to our Savior Messiah and to our God and to be a foot washer unto each other that really that is what's what's important to our family members, our loved ones, our our children, our parents to assist and help each other wherever we can in in love, you know, in just sharing positivity and, you know, the whole random acts of kindness for goodness sake, not because we're seeking expectation or reward, but but just because it feels good to do good, to help others. And so that's what I see, you know, as far as every day and having a new chance to to live in this life and to live in this world, um, to follow the commandments and to do unto others as we would wish done unto ourselves, as, as the Father established for all of us and exampled uh, to all of us through the Son. And so I do wish all of you that have joined me this evening, uh, wherever you may be, I pray for blessings to be upon you and I also hope that you understand the the mortality of being um, in the flesh and that at any time, at any moment that Christ could come again 
or that we could succumb to death, that, you know, accident or tragedy or whatever, you know, the nuclear war, whatever it may be, because you just never know, but that you are utilizing this day, this moment to share with your loved ones and with your friends and even with just passing acquaintances your love of um, uh, of life and the creator and you know of being part and present in this world even though this is a place of suffering and this is a place that is under the rule and the authority of, of Satan and the fallen angels and that we do find a prevalence of evil and a a corresponding wickedness to the reality that we are exposed to and that we are indentured to live in for this lifetime, still, the whole creation is a reflection of the Most High because all things are of God. And so we have the mixture of paradise and, and hell and the duality of good and evil pain and pleasure, um, you know, joy and suffering. And so as much as we can, uh, I hope that we can embrace paradise and joy and peace and the good tidings for the time that we are here and the time that we are sharing with each other until we are returned back to immortality and back to our angelic natures and we are reunited with our uh, bright natures and uh, with you know our former being our spiritual incarnations our first estate and I know uh, like many of you because I know that you are well seasoned seekers and that you like myself are, are ready to return home and that I look forward more than anything uh, to being with the Father and the Son and to have eternity before us in serving them and serving the Morning Star administration that will be when we come to completion when we make it to the apex of why we're here and what we are to fulfill and and that we can, you know, look back and say, oh, what a strange and grand trip that was. And um, and we can laugh about the things that we went through and that we can, you know, share stories about the things that we endured and the things that we learned and, 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 and just reminisce about how, you know, there's no longer any evil and no longer any suffering and that we never have to go through those things again, that would just be just utmost joy. And I know I look forward to that time, and I know that you also look forward to being reunited with your loved ones and your children, your family members, your parents, in that way, and then we'll have eternity to celebrate, to to just honor each other and to do the work of enabling the kingdom for more and more people, um, and to to as angels be in service to whether it's future generations of humanity, you know, and other parts of the universe and creation, however all that is going to unfold. To, but to be, to to earn our wings, so to speak, and to be able to do the bidding of the Father and the Son in whatever service and whatever uh, aspects of service they would have us to do, that's just going to be... Wow, you know, just just wow. And, and anyway, so today, I don't want to get off on a tangent like I often do, uh, but today I'm going to make mention of a couple books which I wanted you 
to be aware of. And one of them is called the Sefer Razael, which is the Sefer in Hebrew means book. And so this is the book of Raziel. And Raziel is a, an angel of the Most High. Uh, and his name, Raziel, means the angel of secrets. And that this particular book was supposedly had, was given to Adam when he was in paradise and that he used to study from it and that he was learning secrets that were not even shared among the angels at that time. And one of the reasons, you know, um, and one of the reasons that all of the angels weren't given uh, certain detail and certain information is because of, of the rebellion, of not only the rebellion of the rebel angels during the time when Christ came into his dominion and was shown to the sons of God as the only begotten and that he and his father were one and that he was, you know, as the visible embodiment of the um, invisible father as the most high, that he was the one really that had created us and that had created all of the angels and all of the creation, and brought, bringing the creation into visibility and making it, uh, showing to us his authority and his power, and also bringing the universe into, uh, so that we could see the expanse of it, and the grandeur of it, and uh, be just awestruck and overwhelmed by the awesomeness of the, the great mystery in the unlimited nature of what is the creation. Um, and Lucifer didn't like that. And and there were, and there have been, and there still are angels that are not willing to side with nor um, align with the Most High, the Father and the Son, and that do not want to do good. They don't want to be servants. They want to be as gods themselves. They want to rule and to have people to bow down to their authority. And they want to make the decisions and to make all the rules and to do as they wish. There are many upon the planet, even today, especially those of the the Canaanite bloodline that... Um, that desire to be the kings and queens, the prime ministers and the presidents and the people of authority, the the so-called important people, the elect, the globalists, the transnationalists, uh, those that are supposedly of the chosen ones. And, you know, they are somewhat because... Uh, for right now, Satan and the the dark side, the fallen angels, they have the power to um, to promote certain individuals and to lay upon them fame and wealth and money and status and power, and that a lot of these individuals consider themselves to be above the law and to be able to do as they wish and that includes even um not only you know utilizing and indulging in sex and drugs and uh money and you know whatever luxury they uh desire but also they're into some very wicked and abominable stuff uh, like pedophilia cuz that seems to run rampant among the elites and uh, those of higher authority and position. There wasn't even long ago that um, one of our senators was found to have, uh, I forget, I think his name is Mendez, he's from Florida. Uh, he was a Cuban senator, but, um, and I don't even know if he's still in office. I don't, I don't follow all that anymore, but uh, he was flying to, some of these third world countries like 
Um, and, you know, in South America, places like Puerto Rico or uh, the Dominican Republic, and he was having sex with, you know, underage underage kids, um, young girls. And then he was flying back, and he was having the taxpayer, you know. These were business trips, and he was writing them off, and he was having the taxpayer pay for all these trips and all these um, illicit love affairs and and you know the some of the girls went public and brought out how he was involved in all these things and and this all became public and you know the story was squashed things were hidden you would not believe and and I'm going to get to um the things that I want to cover this evening but there's another story that just has come to light for me that I want to share with you um, sea tiger has just shared this with the group at fallenangels.tv and this is mind blowing this is absolutely mind blowing um, let, let, let me set the premise I'm going to just spend a few minutes here setting the premise for this information uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, have not studied or looked into the story of Larry Sinclair, he was a, an individual that lived in Chicago, Illinois, well, well actually was on business trip there for his gra- uh, great sons or his um, adopted a godson, his godson's graduation, and he was going to take take them out for some nights of partying and, um, you know, just drunken debauchery, and so he had rented some um, some limos, and he was also a male prostitute, uh, a gay man that was uh, involved in using cocaine and other other things of that nature and and uh he's you know he's went public with all this but anyways in, in his story which came out in the courtroom as well because um he actually tried to sue um Obama Barack Obama uh for defamation or slander or something of that nature uh because they were trying to uh, say that this had never happened and he was going to verify and testify in a court of law, which I believe this uh, went to the Supreme Court in in Illinois or the state court, one of those courts. But anyways, there's, there's a whole court documents and testimony that verifies Larry Sinclair's accounting. There's also books and many different uh, interviews that you can go to to find out more information about what I'm about to tell you. But anyways, so it comes to comes um, once you look into the story, it, you come to find out that uh, Barack Obama was a gay man in his younger life, and that he was involved in a lot of um, very sultry affairs. And that this this particular episode with Larry Sinclair unfolded when he shared a limo with Larry Sinclair, and then they got into a conversation about cocaine, and then um, Barack Obama uh, hooked Larry Sinclair up, um, was able to get him an eight ball of cocaine, which was. Two hundred and fifty dollars worth of uh, of cocaine, and then they began to to start partying together in the back of this limo. And then uh, Larry Sinclair testifies as to um, getting cuddly with Barack Obama, and then engaging in very illicit um, sexual conduct with the president where he serviced him. We'll just we'll just say that. Uh where Larry Sinclair was servicing 
the then state senator, Barack Obama. He didn't know who he was at the time. But, um, and so they, you know, had this particular tryst in the back of this um, limo. And Larry Sinclair also testifies as to how Barack Obama had a crack pipe in his um, in his pocket and that he pulled it out and began to s- smoke some crack. Self-prepared for what, what they were about to engage in. And that um, Barack Obama also went to Larry Sinclair after finding out and um, requesting information about where Larry Sinclair was staying, uh, went to his hotel room and further engaged in other illicit acts and illicit conduct with this particular individual. And so from that accounting, from that story, we've learned that Barack Obama is is gay. And, you know, when he came onto the scene and the whole president, you know, there was the presidential nomination and he and Hillary Clinton were vying for the Democratic nomination and and this inf- this story was covered on a very limited basis, not by the major mainstream news outlets, but I had heard it on... Uh, Rents, I believe Rents had Larry Sinclair on, and there's a uh, an outspoken pastor. I forget his name, um, but he's part of Atla A T L A Ministries up there in Harlem, New York, and he's been very outspoken about Barack Obama being uh, a gay man and how even under the um, where he used to go to Trinity, the church, I believe it's called Trinity um, Church, under Jeremiah Wright, that he was engaged with some of the young men there and also homosexual relations. And and so all of this came out, and and very publicly. And um, the news stories were squashed. It was never something that was aired on ABC, CBS, or or NBC, even though it, it absolutely should have been, uh, considering we everybody was about to elect man or, you know, seemingly elect, because we really don't have any say in elections. Uh, it's all just a dog and pony show. But anyways, so here he was, um, you know, going around with Michelle Obama and their two little young daughters and and so the whole time afterwards I had thought that really um that Barack Obama was a bisexual. Well, just recently our our friend Sea Tiger on the Truth Seeking Network at fallenangels.tv um he posted a video about how Michelle Obama was a male transvestite. And, you know, I, I I thought that this sounded kind of crazy, but knowing that Barack Obama was a gay man, I started to look into it just to see what, what the individual that w- had produced this video was saying or what was, what she was trying to, bring across in the video. And I'm not going to spend too much more time on this, but I think this is important enough that I should share it with you and that you should be aware of what is going on in the White House and especially what our president is up to. Uh, Because, you know, even George Bush, uh, he's a bisexual, and that he had illicit love affairs with Um, Johnny, I forget his name, Mm, I forget his name, but uh, there was a guy named Johnny something that was a male prostitute that had spent many nights in the White House, and that he was also on the 
uh, the guest list and that he had spent many uh, nights overnight within the company of George H.W. Bush. Or no, George W. Bush, the second Bush that was in, uh, the one that started our landslide debt uh, into where, where we are now as far as being in debt up to the wazoo and that we'll never, ever get out. Um, but anyways, and so this is nothing new. Even George H.W. Bush, the first Bush, uh, it was cited in the um, in the Franklin cover-up written by a Senator John DeCamp how he was involved in pedophilia and that uh, he had hired the services of one Larry King, um, who was a, a, a senator, a state senator, um, not the Larry King that used to be on CNN, and that had his own radio show, but a Larry King that was a Republican. He was a, a black gentleman, one of the um, first black Republicans, and that he had hired, it was in, involved with the priests at, in the boys' club in Nebraska and Omaha, and that he was utilizing the children there in the boys' club and also some girls' organization that they were involved in flying these kids around and and using them as underage prostitutes and that they were uh, they were using them to gain political favor among republicans democrats and that this this particular uh, conspiracy reached all the way up to the highest levels of government, including the President George H.W. Bush. And you can find that all out in the book, The Franklin Cover-Up. So there's nothing new with, you know, there being pedophilia and also with there being bisexuals in, in the White House. But um, from the the video that this particular person had put forth, it, there's absolute confirmation, and what she cites within this video is that um, is that the female body type that there are certain proportions, and that there are certain aspects, uh, things like um, like the ring finger of the male of of males the ring finger is longer than what would be the second finger, or if that's the index finger, I believe. And so, and it's it's opposite on women, that their uh, second finger is longer than their ring finger. And that, you know, the middle finger is, of course, longer than both. But that these proportions play out in every person that is of uh, gender uh, unless they, you know, are transvestites or have had sex changes or, or you know, something to um, alter their gender. And that another ratio is that a, a man's shoulders are usually three head, um, three times as wide as their head and that a woman's is usually two and a half times the width of a woman's head and then another aspect ratio uh, is that a man will be eight times as tall as the the length of the person's head and that a woman will stand correspondingly seven times as tall as a woman's uh, a woman's head. And that these proportions play out over and over and over within the individuals, in male and female individuals worldwide. That these proportions are universal and that you can find 
um, examples, you know, of this in every, you know, usually in every person. And, and also, Wacharu says that the neck muscles and also the the Adam's apple will give a person away. But anyways, this person, and you can find this video on FallenAngels.tv. Sea Tiger just recently uploaded it. It's called Irrefutable Proof that um, Irrefutable Proof that Michelle Obama is a man. And after watching this, I am absolutely con uh, convinced that Michelle Obama is a transvestite male because the person utilizes photographs, imagery, um, to show you these proportions over and over and over, different photographs and, um, you know, and, and, and a speak and, and shows you that without a doubt that Michelle Obama, uh, her ring finger is just as it says for what would be a male is longer than her second finger and that it's reversed for those of women. And you can, you can confirm this for yourself. And also the the height, and also the the sh shoulder width, uh, th those co corresponding proportions, also in my mind confirm that Michelle Obama is in fact a transvestite male, and that Barack Obama is in no way bisexual, but is absolutely a gay man has been his whole life and every time you see them together um he is with another man and that he has pulled the the wool down over the eyes of America and that most people have no clue as to that first we have a a, a queen as a first lady and that we have an absolute without question a gay man in the white house in that barack obama um not saying he's the first gay man because there have been many more even we know for a fact that george bush and george hw bush that they were at least bisexual um if they didn't weren't more homosexual, and that this occurs a lot within the line of Cain, that hom homosexuality and pedophilia and bisexuality and polygamy, these kind of traits and this kind of a nature, is um, very predominant within the seed of the serpent, and that these kind of things are taught to their children um, and that they you know a lot of the elites rape their children even from a young age uh, you can look to the testimony of Kathy O'Brien uh, for confirmation as to uh, and very detailed confirmation as to how the elites are involved in this kind of behavior and so anyways uh, Stephanie Duncan asks, are you sure? A and I absolutely am positively sure, Steph. I, I know it sounds completely crazy, and when I first looked into it, uh, I thought, you know, that it would be, you know, that it couldn't be. I, I thought Barack Obama was a bisexual, but no, he is absolutely 150% gay and that um in you know I'm I'm convinced also that uh, Michelle Obama still has a package um still has genitalia corresponding to that of a man and that the girls wherever they came from uh they were definitely not carried by Michelle Obama and that they are adopted 
or you know, I don't know how they came to be the kids of two men, but they were not produced naturally. And so I just thought I'd share with you that little tidbit and and you know take it for whatever you wish. Um but look into it. It's 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 interesting to say the least. And in, in my opinion it's mind blowing and it just shows it just reinforces the fact that America and the people of the world and even those of us that are well Search, um, seekers of truth that have been spending, you know, the, the past at least decade, twenty years in studying about the conspiracies, and um, it, there's we learn something every day, and the conspiracy conspiracy just seems to get darker and deeper and stranger. And who who knows what we're going to learn next. Um, and so that being said, I'm going to go ahead and go back into the topic and the discussion for today. I wanted to share one other piece of information with you real quick. And to me covering the Sefer Raziel and the Sefer Yitzara, uh, I'm not going to be reading a whole lot from the actual text anyways. Um, the text for both is very deep and um and for a lot of people even for myself some aspects of it is just completely over my head it would take you know somebody that's well versed and in the study of like something like the kabbalah or something um but that even the sefer yitzera which i i'm also going to be making mention of today the in the sefer yitzera which is another one of those secret books. Um, this that book tells how the Most High and the reason why Yahushua, as the Son, is called the Word, is because he utilized the Hebrew alphabet to sing the creation into being, and that with uh, vocalization he was able to manifest the creation and that using certain vowels and certain letters and um, saying them and, and you know in the way that um, he did the Sefer Yitzhara covers how Yahushua as the word how he um, basically sang the creation into um manifestation and that he was able to instantly manifest uh, with the use of his focus and intent in that way and that it still works that way except for we you know we don't manifest instantly unless the will of god is uh behind our intent and that they would uh, desire us to do so as Christ examples when he manifested all the the fish and all the the bread for you know the loaves of bread for all the people uh, that was a that was a an example of manifestation and utilizing focus and will to bring forth out of nothingness and that even today you know um as being co-creators with the most high that and also as being sons of God caught up in flesh embodiment in these um vessels of dust that we still work in the same way. You know, we catch an idea, we um start to work with those ideas, whether it's a book or a piece of art or whatever it is that that idea we um we train our focus on it. We put forth our energy uh, in different different modes and different methods to to you know make that piece of art or that idea into reality. Or uh, even in the way that people create a business, it's all the same kind of thing. 
that manifestation and uh, bringing from the spirit into reality that the method is very similar um, as to, you know, Christ singing the universe into being. And so the Sefer Yatsera covers all of that. And again, it's a very heavy um, book and, and can be over, over you know, the even somebody that's PhD, well-researched, well-versed, that has studied the Word and the Scriptures for a lifetime, there's a lot of it that, you know, it just seems to almost not make sense because um, it's just such heavy material. But I wanted to cover one other story real quick, and then we'll go back to the uh, the Sefer Raziel. And this is important, too. And let me check the chat room real quick. Um, all right. Uh, I'm gonna, and if you have any questions, of course, just put them in the chat room, and I'll try to get to them as I can. I did, and those of you that are asking about jazz, I, I did speak with her earlier, and she said that she would be here, but um, I guess she was unable to make it. But, anyways, this is a very important piece of information, and I covered this on this Wednesday evening's broadcast on Revolution Radio. Uh, and this is another piece of information that was shared by C. Tiger on the FallenAngels.tv website. It, and the story is this, and you can look this up for yourself. I won't read all of it, but I'll share enough of it that you'll understand what I'm what I'm bringing forth here. Uh, newly found megalithic ruins in Russia contain the largest blocks of stone ever discovered i'm only going to read the first paragraph and then i'll i'll tell you a little bit more details and then we're going to go into the separate raziel uh and this article was published march 10th 2014 by michael snyder it says mount shariah an incredible discovery that was recently made in russia threatens to shatter Conventional theories about the history of the planet. On Mount Shariah in southern Siberia, researchers have found an absolutely massive wall of granite stones. Some of these gigantic granite stones are estimated to weigh more than 3,000 tons. And as you will see below, many of them were cut with flat surfaces, surfaces right angles, and sharp corners. Nothing of this magnitude has ever been discovered before. The largest stone found at the megalithic ruins at Baalbek, Lebanon, is less than 1,500 tons. So how in the world did someone cut 3,000-ton granite stones with extreme precision, transport them up the side of a mountain, and stack them 40 meters high? According to the commonly accepted version of history, it would be impossible for ancient humans with very limited technology to accomplish such a thing. All right, I'm going to skip actually to the last paragraph. And there are um, several images, photographs uh, located with the article. And if you're Trying to find it, um, if you go to the FallenAngels.tv website, it's the sixth article down, I believe. I'm just going to skip to the last paragraph, the very last part of the last paragraph, because he asked some very pertinent questions here, of which we, because all of you are aware of the work that many of us are, have now done on the prior times and how the fallen angels were here before um, modern humanity and that the creation and also the earth and the universe are millions of years old and, you know, not just 7,000 years, that the 7,000 years actually corresponds to the second world age and the advent of what was modern humanity upon the face of the planet 
but that was there was an age, a pre-Adamic age, prior to um, prior to that, and and so and also that we cover in Genesis how um, Genesis is actually an accounting of the recreation and the reformation of the earth, and that this particular planet used to be what is referenced as or called Tiamat and that it used to be um, where the asteroid belt is now and that in fact the asteroid belt is remnants of some of the cataclysm the destruction that took place that shifted the planet to the orbit we are in now and to the proximity uh, placing us 93 million miles from the sun, which scientists call the Goldilocks band, which makes it perfect for the sustenance of life and the rapid multiplicity of life uh, that we find here upon this planet. And so, anyways, I've covered that in many different shows. Uh, If you want to know more, look to a show called Genesis Revisited. Or, you know, I I also write about this in great detail in my book, Sons of God, Who We Are and Why We're Here, which is my sixth book. Okay, that being said, I'm going to read real quickly this last uh, paragraph. These Roman temples were actually built on top of an ancient 5 million square foot platform that was made from some of the largest stones ever used in any construction project in the history of the earth. In fact, the largest stone found near the Baalbek ruins weighs approximately 1,200 tons and is about 64 feet long. To put that in perspective, that is the equivalent of approximately, well, they don't say that in this, but I'll skip that sentence. How people in ancient times were able to move such massive stones is a complete mystery. In fact, these giant construction stones were stacked so closely together that you can't even fit a piece of paper between many of them. Many of the architectural feats found at Baalbek cannot even be duplicated with 21st century technology. So how did they do it? How did they move such massive stones to create a structure of such intricate precision Keep in mind that the base of Baalbek ruins alone weighs approximately 5 billion tons. Evidence continues to mount that very sophisticated technology was used in the ancient world. These megalithic ruins are undeniable reminders of highly advanced ancient civilizations. So who were they and what happened to them? Could it be possible that they were wiped out by a massive global cataclysm? such as a global flood, Um, all very pertinent questions and ones that science should be asking and most absolutely should be seeking the answers for. And so just to give you an idea for those of you that are new to the show, uh, because we do, we have new listeners joining us a lot, especially from those that, um, uh, have been following the, our shows on Revolution Radio, uh, Momentary Zen, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern every Wednesday evening, because we reach quite a, a massive audience there, a lot more than we do here on blogtalkradio.com. Uh, .com. But anyways, uh, for those that don't know, uh, the Fallen Angels, as I see, as I I believe, I verify and prove from Scripture, um, the fallen angels were here on this planet before we were. They were banished on what was the second day of creation uh, when uh, the separation of light and darkness, and again, this corresponds to the dominion uh, and the revealing of the Son, Yahushua as the only begotten, and that it was during his being introduced to the sons of God, that we first knew that he was the son of the creator, and that 
um, the Creator, the Father, was, and and the Son were the ones that created all of us as the angels. And I'm talking about our first estate, our prior embodiment, our spiritual incarnation, and that um, and that this is when Lucifer, as the first created archangel, uh, found jealousy and iniquity was found within him, and that he decided to rebel. And he tempted one-third of the angels of the Most High to join him in insurrection. And that there was a war in heaven, and it divided all the angels. And that uh, there was massive, even cataclysms that took place within the heavens. And that um, Yahushua and Michael and uh, the other angels, they banished them and cast them out. Kicked them out from the upper heavens. And it says in the second book of uh, Enoch, the secrets of the book of Enoch, or the book of the secrets of Enoch, that they were banished here to the dark earth and that they had arrived into this solar system um, by by being captured, uh, their planet of origin, uh, the or their planet that they had uh, been going through the universe and galaxies upon Nibiru was captured a long time ago and became part of this solar system and became known as the planet of the crossing. And in its initial capture with um, the, the gravity of Neptune and Uranus out there in the outer solar system that it was their gravity, their um, what's called net pool by the Sumerians, that it brought Nibiru into um, conflict with Tiamat, which was the Earth at that time. And one of the moons of Tiamat split asunder and gutted the Earth, and that it was. Um, it was pushed to the the orbit that it now is in, and also that the moon was shifted with it, the moon that we have now, and that um, and that this is when the next chapter of life, the next era of life for this particular planet began, and that the Pacific Ocean is where the the deep gouge from that particular uh, cataclysm and that you know the planet being struck by the moon that that's where it had hit and that is where the oceans and you know all all the land be- becoming um, the land and the oceans and the rivers all separating the corresponding passages after uh, what is the dividing of the firmaments in Genesis because in Genesis it it also immortalizes this particular event uh, that the Enuma Elish and all the other uh, epic creation stories also speak about this particular event. But anyway, so um, you can look to all that to get an idea for when the prior times began because it was after that that the fallen angels, the Anunnaki, they arrived here to this particular planet. They established Eridu, which was the first colony uh, referred to as home in the faraway. Um, and that, uh, that um, that's when the, you know, the, the Anunnaki began to create in all the megalithic type structures that we find all over the planet. And that they had established all these megalithic pyramidical type complexes all over the of the planet, and so that's what I refer to as the prior times, and that's why you see structures as what is being mentioned here in this particular article, and that even Baalbek, you know, the stones of Baalbek, uh, just to give you an idea, the 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 one stone called the stone of the pregnant woman uh, weighs 
1,260 tons, and that it would take 18 heavy lifting modern day cranes working in conjunction together to lift this one stone, but that because they would be surrounding them, um, you know, at every turn and every way in a in a complete circle, you know, all working together just trying to lift the stone, they would not even be able to move it anywhere, but that they could only lift it. And that these stones, uh, the stones in, in Baalbek, that they were lifted up and placed on top of others, and that the ones in Russia, uh, in this particular Siberian, on this particular mountain, they were lifted and stacked and placed, um, you know, in parallel with each other to create this massive stone wall. And so these things were not done by the ancestors of humanity. These things were done by the fallen angels prior to are ever having arrived upon this particular planet. And so just know that and and you it it, it takes understanding that it for you to understand what we are seeing in the geological, the archaeological record of the planet. Cause as I've been stating for years now, we are just now starting to find some of these ancient sites that with the use of satellite technology, many ancient cities, it's my opinion there are more still not yet found than there are found and that are known about. And that there are many that are on the bottoms of the oceans and that that is going to be um, a, a uh, a huge profession, underwater archaeology is going to be a, a huge profession um, very soon. And that many cities are still under the growth, under the deep jungle growth in places like the Amazon, in South America, and Mexico. And, and, that, um, and also another big one is that many of these ancient sites, pyramids, structures, are going to be found under the ice caps of Antarctica and places like the North Pole and um, Greenland, Alaska, that um, that we're going to find these complexes even under deep layers and levels of ice and snow. And so there's still a lot to be discovered and unless you understand that the fallen angels were here first and that the age of the earth in indeed is much older than 7,000 years and that what the Bible is referencing as the second world age and that corresponds to 7,000 years is only the advent of modern humanity here upon the planet but that there was a pre-Adamic age and people uh, and even pre-Adamic humans were here before we were. The the, and the Bigfoot was a pre-Adamic human that was here before we were. Um, and anyways, so you can look to all this stuff um, for yourself so that you can understand what we're talking about here and that when you read my books or or when you know some kind of discovery such as this comes to light it's just verification of the things that we've been saying for a, a very long time now and that unless you understand it this way unless you have discernment this way it, it's just really not going to make sense to you and so uh, which is another way to get your children interested in the scripture, letting them know about, you know, the secrets that are veiled and that are contained um, within the gospel that it tells us about the prior times and that the fallen angels were here before we were. 
Okay, so let's go back to the Sefer Raziel. I'm going to give you just a little bit of background information first, and then I'm going to read a little bit about from um, from it. But th- this Sefer Raziel was supposedly a book that, you know, as I had made mention earlier, was given to Adam, and that it it says that it was cut from either a sapphire or an emerald, depending on what history and what accounting you um, you read from, and whether it as a book of wisdom, because you know how uh, quartz crystals can be imbued with knowledge, and that that the knowledge can be extracted from it, but that it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, written like a book with pages and and um and written with words. And so it I'm wondering whether the Sefer Raziel uh, as a book and because it was cut from this particular crystal, whether it was something similar like the um like the ancient crystal skulls, because, you know, they they are said to uh, contain immense knowledge and to also have been encoded with knowledge that we don't yet know, understand how to extract, but that supposedly people that have psychic abilities or um, that can work in those kind of paranormal, supernatural ways that they can tap into such knowledge. And so I'm wondering if the Sefer Raziel was something of similar aspect, considering, because um, how would you really write a, a book with a bunch of different pages from a gem? You know, even if it's a large gem, how how would that be? So it doesn't make sense that way, but... Anyways, and so this particular book, the again, Raziel means the angel of secrets, and that he was the one that delivered uh, this book to Adam once he was banished from paradise and kicked out of paradise. Um, but that some of the history speaks about how... Uh, Adam, when he was in paradise, he was given this particular book by God, by the Most High God, and he was allowed to study from it. And that when he was banished from paradise, it was taken from him, but that when he arrived on the wilderness of the earth and he was transformed into flesh, that he prayed to uh, to um, the Most High God for to have it again as comfort so that he could teach his sons and their sons uh, and that they could pass it down in generations and uh, over, you know, through um, the different patriarchs of the seed of the woman. But um, anyways, uh, uh, other stories about the book of Raziel is that it was hidden um, that sometime between Adam to Enoch, and, and this could have happened during the time of Enoch, because there are certain texts that speak about how um, Enoch, or the, the third patriarch of the line of Adam, that they strayed, and, and that they started to get involved in controversy in that they uh, did not uphold righteousness in a way um, that they should have. And and so, anyways, sometime between Adam and Enoch, the book was lost and it was hidden. And Enoch was given a dream, and he followed the um, the the details and the directions within the dream to rediscover the book of Raziel. 
and that he was able to study and to learn all the secrets of the heaven. Uh, and even it speaks about in the book of Enoch how the book of Raziel was inspiration for that particular text. And that even during the time of Adam, Adam was able to read from the book of Raziel, however it was, you know, because, again, it's my opinion that this was something um, of, you know, a gemstone nature that was encoded and that had all of the knowledge of going all the way to what would be the return of Christ and the advent of the harvest, the, the separation of the wheat and the tares that all of that was encoded within this particular book. And that Adam was able to read about his sons and their sons and all of those that would be born of his line. And that he could read every day and, and all knowledge was encoded within this particular book. And that he even knew about uh, the flood that was coming during the time of Noah and and how uh, Enoch would walk with God uh, and that he would be translated, some say, as the angel Metatron. But anyways, uh, so Enoch um, had read from this particular book and he was shown by... I believe it was the angel Phanael, how to uh, how to transcribe the secrets of heaven, and he was told to write from it, and that he wrote 366 books as knowledge and books of wisdom for his children from it, and that we are supposed to have the legacy of all that information with us but that we do not have um such knowledge anymore this you know the books of Enoch have in my opinion been eradicated and disappeared and destroyed by the seed of Cain and by the um the seed of the serpent the fallen angels that the reason we why we only have 3 books of Enoch and most people are only aware of 2 but there, there is a third book of Enoch. Um, it's a Hebrew text as well. But the reason we do not have all these texts is because they contain incredible and detailed information. Even the first book of Enoch and the second book of Enoch are just mind-blowing in the information that they present to us. And that the even the first book of Enoch speaks about how it was written for a future generation. And that we are that generation. We're the last days generation. We're the uh, fig tree generation. And we're the ones that that information was written for. And it's also my opinion that that was one of the reasons why... Um, I forget who who his name was, but that he was able to find a copy of the book of Enoch in the Ethiopian Bible and that he was able to bring three of these translations back and reawaken and re um, make make the Western cultures aware of the book of Enoch and make it available again to us as a people, as a collective. And that confirmation of the Book of Enoch was also found among the Dead Sea Scrolls that it was one of the few texts which, you know, there were many different copies of the Book of Enoch found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, fragments, you know, fragmentary, of course, uh, but that showed how important and how honored and revered the book of Enoch was to the um to the Essene, the Qumran uh, you know the those that were 
living within that scholarly community. And and so, you know, it would just be mind blowing to have other copies of the other books that Enoch had dictated um and that wrote down for his children and his children's children. Uh, and maybe at some day we'll have more information such as that come to light. Um, for those that don't know, it was just recently discovered in another one of the Dead Sea Scroll caves. Nine more texts had been found. And so, and there was not long ago that 70 books, um, 70 books were found in the Jordanian Valley, and that both of these collections have yet to be translated and made available. Um, C. Tiger asked me, do I have a link for the third book of Enoch? Uh, not right offhand, but just search for the Hebrew translation the Hebrew book of Enoch, and you'll find it. Because the other ones were, you know, again, the based on the, um, the Ethiopic. And if I, if you can't find it, just let me know and I will, I'll find it for you uh, at some point. But for those that are interested, you can also find it in a um in a book of compiled works called the Pseudepigrapha and it's in the first book the first collection um the all three of the books of Enoch are found within that text i do recommend getting both of these huge collections of work for those that are interested in you know, the extra biblical, extra canonical, extra scriptural works that we are not um, aware of, that so many do not know anything about, that R.H. Charlesworth, he has compiled, in both of these books are about at least 400, 500 pages, and they contain many different um many different works that are lost and not available, some not anywhere else. And and so you can find these two collections, they're about thirty bucks a piece. They're called the Pseudepigrapha. And you can find them on Amazon. The Pseudepigrapha Volumes One and Two by R. H. Charlesworth. Okay. Going back, because we're going to quickly run out of time. And so, I'm just going to read just a little bit from, just to give you an idea, before we run out of time. This is from the first book, The Prayer of Adam, the First Man. This will give you an idea for how this particular book is written. It says this. This is the prayer spoken by Adam when cast out of the Garden of Eden from his prayers for mercy. He was given the holy book by the compassion of the Lord. Adam spoke, Lord, eternal God of the universe, you created all the universe by power and glory. The kingdom is everlasting beauty going from generation to generation. Nothing is unknown and nothing hidden from your eyes. You created me by your hand to hold dominion over all living creatures and lord over actions. The cunning and accursed serpent of the tree deceived my wife and me by lies, leading us astray to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. I know not what will become of my wife and myself and my sons and the generations coming after. I am disobedient and foolish running away before your power and not answering nor raising my eyes, ashamed of sins of wickedness and iniquity, knowing you would cast me out in today. Here I am in the wilderness to plow the soil and toil upon the earth, 
receiving nourishment from it, trembling in fear upon the earth, dwelling from this time, by eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge and not heeding your words, not receiving wisdom, I know not what will come from foolishness. You are merciful and rule with great passion. I am the first man you created and breathed into me the Ruach and gave me the Nefesh. I beg mercy of compassion. Be slow to anger and show mercy as prayers rise up to the throne of glory. I petition for salvation from the throne of compassion. Let there be mercy. I desire to speak in your presence. No longer hiding as I pray for mercy. The everlasting Lord of the universe holds dominion over all, ruling in great compassion. I pray you reveal what will come of the generations coming after, what will occur every day and every month. I pray you do not conceal the wisdom. Watch over me and sustain my labors. Adam prayed for three days. And God sent forth Raziel, the angel who dwelled upon the river going forth from the Garden of Eden. He was revealed to Adam as the sun went black. By his hand the, he gave the book to Adam, saying, Do not fear and lament no longer. From the day you served in prayer, the prayers are heard. I come to give the knowledge of the words of purity and great wisdom. Become wise by the words of this most holy book. They reveal until the day of death, all sons serve below. All generations coming after are guided by this holy book to prosper in purity. Be humble in Ruach. Reveal all that is written in. Know what comes to pass every month and between day and night. Every word is revealed. What to do in heavy rain or in times of drought? How to increase crops? Hold dominion over wickedness in the world? What to do when plagued with locusts and locust larvae? Learn what to do when fruit is picked off the trees, when you are plagued with boils, when to fight wars and when to turn away. Learn how to act when disease comes to man or beast, when the good come upon the higher highest favor when the wicked spill blood and when to lament that the profane have desecrated the flesh Adam drew this is going to be the last paragraph because we've already ran out of time and I apologize that for that but definitely read this for yourself if you can uh, it's an interesting book to say the least Adam drew near and heard learning to be guided by the holy book Reziel the angel opened the book and read the words Hearing the words of the holy book from the mouth of Reziel, the angel, he fell upon the ground trembling in fear. Reziel spoke, Rise up and be strong. Revere the power of God. Take the book from my hand and learn from it. Understand the knowledge. Make it known to all pure. Therein establish what will occur in all time. All right, I think we're going to stop there. Um, but this, you know, I just wanted to share this book with you so that you can know there is so much out there that we do not know about and do not have access to. And that, in my opinion, we should try to study everything that we can get our hands on. It's in studying that we show ourselves approved. And with that, uh, join me this Wednesday if you get a chance. I will be joined with Dr. Uh, with Dr. Joy, and we'll be covering um, her three latest three book series, Beguiled. God bless all. Good night. Sex or certain pastimes, recreational pursuits. Um, a lot of time for people it will be it, drugs or alcohol or uh, or pills, or you know anything of that nature, or even you're in your focus with your job and those things which consume so much of your life. I long ago uh, have had this chance, and I decided that you know 
really to only do what I thought was important and to not waste any time, to not allow myself to to spend a lot of time on tr- pursuits that I thought were trivial or meaningless or nonsensical. Now, there's a difference between holding balance as far as um, seeking entertainment and finding joy and pleasure in life because that also is an absolute necessity and it's beneficial for spirit and for soul, for the heart and for emotional, mental and uh, physical and um, spiritual well-being for people to do that. But it's also good for people to focus on achievement and dreams and goals and doing things which are real. And that, for me, is the focus on the kingdom and also the uh, the focus on our eternal inheritance, because that's really what we're here to do and what we're here to achieve and accomplish and uh, realigning ourselves with the salvation that has been graciously extended to all of us by the sacrifice of the Most High on the cross and giving of himself as Passover lamb so that we could have a cleansing of slate, a a renewed opportunity for for doing the works that would align with the faith that comes with bearing the cross and comes with being the example that Christ was for us in being a good servant to each other and to our Savior Messiah and to our God and to be a foot washer unto each other that really that is what's what's important to our family members, our loved ones, our our children, our parents to assist and help each other wherever we can in in love, you know, in just sharing positivity and, you know, the whole random acts of kindness for goodness sake, not because we're seeking expectation or reward, but but just because it feels good to do good, to help others. And so that's what I see, you know, as far as every day and having a new chance to to live in this life and to live in this world, um, to follow the commandments and to do unto others as we would wish done unto ourselves, as as the Father established for all of us and exampled uh, to all of us through the Son. And so I do wish all of you that have joined me this evening, uh, wherever you may be, I pray for blessings to be upon you and I also hope that you understand the the mortality of being um, in the flesh and that at any time, at any moment that Christ could come again or that we could succumb to death that, you know, accident or tragedy or whatever, you know the nuclear war whatever it may be because you just never know, but that you are utilizing this day, this moment, to share with your loved ones and with your friends and even with just passing acquaintances your love of um, uh, of life and the Creator and you know of being part and present in this world. Even though this is a place of suffering and this is a place that is under the rule and the authority of and grand harmony as the the great mystery is absolutely the most fascinating 
film one could ever imagine or piece together in that the creator has done all of this so that we can be witness to the grandeur of his majesty in every aspect of what is the creation from macrocosm to microcosm because all things reflect his glory. And in everything, I see and feel the presence of wonder and just am awed and humbled by the awesomeness of of everything. And I know for a lot of people that um, even the kids of today, they've, they've lost this perspective. They're not, they don't see the beauty, the magnificence within nature and just are overwhelmed by waking up to new day and being exposed to new dream. I guess having uh, acquired a severe disability long ago in my life and having my mortality tested for moments uh, because I did die four times in the process of transitioning to my disability but um, when you're touched in that way by the severity of moment and almost have all your tomorrows taken from you it's a reality check and it it gives you perspective to reassess what is new and what is important and what is relevant in life and being and also gives you a chance to realign yourself with priority relationships not only among people but you know with the creation and with God and with whatever it is that you thought was important in your life whether it be um you know uh certain certain things of interest whether it's uh even the opposite of satan and the fallen angels and that we do find a prevalence of evil and a correspond a corresponding wickedness to the reality that we are exposed to and that we are indentured to live in for this lifetime still the whole creation is a reflection of the most high because all things are of god and so we have the mixture of paradise and and hell and the duality of good and evil pain and pleasure um joy and suffering and so as much as we can uh, I hope that we can embrace paradise and joy and peace and the good tidings for the time that we are here and the time that we are sharing with each other until we are returned back to immortality and back to our angelic natures and we are reunited with our uh, bright natures and uh, with you know our former being our spiritual incarnations our first estate and I know uh, like many of you because I know that you are well seasoned seekers and that you like myself are, are ready to return home and that I look forward more than anything uh, to being with the Father and the Son and to have eternity before us in serving them and serving the Morning Star administration that will be when we come to completion, when we make it to the apex of why we're here and what we are to fulfill and, and that we can, you know, look back and say, Oh, what a strange and grand trip that was and um and we can laugh about the things that we went through and that we can you know share stories about 
the things that we endured and the things that we learned and 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 just reminisce about how you know there's no longer any evil and no longer any suffering. Aware always where I am in moment, trying not to mix energy with those forcing misery upon self and world, through insane conduct always attracting karmic consequence. Long have I learned to recognize cycles and patterns, embracing embracing the wisdom of higher teaching. I am rambling free now, one moment to the next, with no particular affiliation or set way. One must seek out and find spirit for personal awakening, giving thanks to creator and creation in one's own way. The magnificent earth a temple worthy of housing the holy. I praise the Most High for my conscious being. Finding church this moment, may I always act upon what I know. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is FallenAngels.tv, and it's another Sabbath broadcast as we Move on into spring, this being the second day of it, and I hope that wherever you may be, that you are finding the day beautiful and glorious, and that you are finding your spirit moved by just the warmth and the um, abundance of inspiration that comes from spring and the collective blooming and of the creatures and the birds as all things begin to prepare for what will be the warm coming warm months and chance to um, really be outside in the elements and to experience nature in in what is a paradisical way cuz uh, I don't know if you're that moved by by spring as I am, but um, I think that, you know, the unfolding of spring and creation and the way that it all comes together and 